friends, welcome to episode 50 of Storyteller Conclave. This is a show all about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game that you can, whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft, or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level. I am Sarah. And I'm Rob. How we doing, Rob? You know, not too bad, considering. Yeah, I yeah. mean, we, we've reached a new normal of of what this is, and I think based on the new normal, I'm, I'm doing okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not gonna lie, I'm struggling a little bit. Uh, haven't, but but I'm 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 finding especially like the podcast nights are mm-hmm. good nights to kind of break me out of my funk and get my feet back under me and kind of reintroduce what I've known to be normal and coming here and doing the show and yeah, I, I I think for us it is a sense of therapy as well because it gives us something to come back to and, yeah and also yeah. a a driving force for both of us to say hey you got something to do on Wednesday right right you like know. get get up. Take a shower, put some pants on, yep, you know. <laughs> yep, yep, exactly. Uh, or snow boots. I mean, geez, snow Mother boots. Nature. Oh, thank thank you, Michigan. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Michigan, for yeah. that. Yeah. If you haven't been watching the weather, it's about as insane as everything else. That's. I mean, it just seems normal. Yeah. It's just part of the normal now. So. Yeah. And yeah. here in Michigan, we had snow showers today on yeah. April 15th, of all things. So. Yeah. I mean, we've had this before. I mean, we had snow on Mother's Day a few years. Yeah. So I'm really not that surprised. Yeah, I'm not... I'm, I'm used to it, I guess, but it's still not pleasant to see, so... Indeed, indeed. Anyway, uh, so we have a show tonight. We do, we do. And, uh, so we're, we're talking a little bit tonight, I think, about, uh, the inherent violence in tabletop games. Yeah. And kind of where that came from, and, uh, whether or not it's actually needed. Yeah, and I, I, I did a little digging, because... I had my own opinions on where I thought kind of tabletop role playing was, mm-hmm. and where some of the the additional subculture kind of had cutted to, and where some creators had gone to. And I think it's kind of come to a a not a bad point. You're right. Oh, yeah. That's what you get. That's what you get now. Okay. So the t- the the pro tip i'm going to give to everybody today is to breathe air and drink water don't try to do it the other way around no no it doesn't work out for you i'll be right back yeah yeah take take your second but yeah i was i think for me it was more had to do with uh the fact that i i had the different games that we were working with that over the last few years even some of the stuff that i've seen at gen con had been changing and I'm not saying that we have more or less murder hoboey games, mm-hmm. but I think we're coming to a more of a balance than I thought. Okay, I think the popular ones are still, at least on the Western culture mm-hmm. uh, of of game creation, we're still very much in the stabby stabby shooty shooty ruin you know the lives of whatever is in our way. Yeah, sure, sure. But uh, I think when it when it comes right down to it, there's a lot more games coming out that are different. Well, and I'm going to bring up some of them, but. I think for me, when we first started into this discussion, I started writing up the stuff for it. I thought about like, where did this come from? Mm-hmm. Like, has have stories always been okay with heroes just randomly murdering things? And I started Might thinking, makes right, and... yeah, yeah. And I started thinking yeah. back, and I was just like, where does this begin? Like, do we go back to Greek tragedies and take a look at those? And I kind of did. I started looking through those to see, you know, mm-hmm. how far back. And a lot of those have a lot of morality to them, to a degree. Sure. I mean. And I'm not going to say they all made sense. Sure, sure. A sure. lot of it I mean, was God based, you yeah. know, and and what what gods believe and things like that. Um, but uh, I think for the the heart of it, like you even come up to like Shakespearean times and the writings of of that period, and we still don't find a lot of heroes going on, you know, basically like, you know, rampages almost mm-hmm. that we're used to seeing today. It, it isn't until later. It isn't until we start seeing writings that occur post-revolutions. And I say fictitious writing. I'm going to focus on that. Um, and that's really where I start kind of seeing it. Mm-hmm. Um, one person who came up a lot of times in my searches was Alexander Dumas. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of Monte Cristo. Yep. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, um, D'Artagnan romances, which were yep. the original, um, Three Musketeers stuff, uh, The Nutcracker, mm-hmm. um, The Prince of Thieves. Did uh, he do Men in the Iron Mask as well? Uh, yeah, kind of. It was part of the D'Artagnan romances. Okay. Um, that whole concept in its, um, in its form. But, um, somebody actually had a really good piece and it came out of The Independent back in 2014. 
Uh, I think it was Boyd Tonkin is what I've got here. And that is, um, time and time again, the child of the mocked and dishonored man of color would invent sons who valiantly kept keep faith with slighted fathers, victims of gross injustice who pursue vengeance and vindication, short-fused warrior heroes whose swords jump from their scabbards at the merest whiff of an insult. At the start of The Three Musketeers, D'Artagnan father tells him, Never submit quietly to the slightest indignity, for it is by his courageous his courage alone that a gentleman makes his way nowadays. Have no fear of my what is that uh, many embrulios yeah. uh, and look about uh for adventure he is he and his creator did that, and that's <clears throat> that that was the belief, and it came from um Dumas's father uh was uh um dark skinned. Okay. Um he was a mixed um a mix of races, but he was uh, brought to France um by uh his father as okay. a free man. And when uh they were at a I believe a theater, um another man meant to slight uh Dumas's father's father, so his grandfather. Sure. By saying like, "Oh, your 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 uh your helper here." is dressed very well. Oh. And it was his son. And literally swords were drawn and like canes were beat. And like, there was a beat down going to happen in that theater and people like the police came effectively. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that moment kind of drove him mm-hmm. and that's what kind of picked that. That's what, where Dumas's views came from. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, and actually his, his name came from his grandmother and he became a war hero. Mm-hmm. Like uh, relatively highly decorated, um, and and known, which is the reason why some of his writings became so popular. But I think that drove certain something. Oh sure, like, sure. And that's a, I, I a can ti- see... That's a, a sign of the times as well. Mm-hmm. So I think that whole concept that, um, that by your courage alone, a gentleman makes his way. Yeah, and that even the slightest indignity must be met with strength. Right, right. It was a totally different feeling. Well, understanding that Dumas came from a you know a a background of you know suffering racial you know oh yeah uh, totally racial indignities and uh, you know also uh, a military background and stuff like that. I mean, it paints a pretty clear picture then Mm -hmm. of you know it's okay to kill as long as they're the bad guys. Right. I mean that that's straight out of the the military thing. Right. And never allow your honor to be challenged Mm -hmm. because if you give them an inch, they'll walk all over you. Exactly is absolutely a something I see in a lot of uh, minority communities that, um, uh, you know, the queer community, uh, you know, racial minorities, things mm-hmm. like that, where... Yeah. Fiscal minorities. Yeah, you've, you've got to stand up for yourself, mm-hmm. or they will just continue to walk all over you. So it's, mm-hmm. it's telling, and then I think that is kind of telling of our time coming forward, mm-hmm. that why we, ala- we latch on to it is that, that concept and why it seems very acceptable because mm-hmm. coming from a culture of nerddom geekdom sure you're a minority mm-hmm. you know might makes right makes sense you know and it's hidden it's a it's an undertone on everything yeah sure sure you know there were so many people who either went with the you know uh the paladin kind of feel and and took that as a as a code and and, and i will never be slighted you know and then you also had those who basically were playing up the rogue elements of Mm -hmm. like you know i'm going to subvert and take care of my problems the best way i can and so i think there's a lot of that in there um but uh it's it's easy to see it coming back around yeah i mean if also if you if you look at the the origins of where we got our our role playing games from too. Um, okay, like look back to Gary Gygax. Right. Um, you know, even before there was Dungeons and Dragons, there was Chainmail. Oh, true, which true. Came from a lot of like these strategy war games. Yeah. You know, um, the origins of 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 role playing games, as it was, was a lot more like um, you know, use tr- strategic command of playing out like World War Two. Yeah. You know, in like. You'd even, like, mail in, you know, one week would be one turn, and you would mail in your moves, and mm-hmm. you'd do your logistics and your diplomacy and stuff like that that way. Mm-hmm. You know, those kind of evolved into yeah. smaller games and stuff, but they were still very dungeon-crawly. 
uh, with miniatures and such like that. Yeah. Then uh, Gary Gygax was working on Chainmail for a while, and mm-hmm. then what Chainmail became was first editions uh, uh, of Dungeons and Dragons. Right, right. So its roots are already in strategy warfare. Mm-hmm. So it was actually it was actually the the, the playing of roles and mm-hmm. the telling of stories thereafter that was the afterthought, not mm-hmm. the war gaming. I'm aspects. with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so you know when you're when you're looking at it like that, it, you know. A lot of games, um, we're, we're getting to a much better place, I think, in the gaming you know world where we've oh, got a, so. a huge variety of games for all different styles of story that we want to tell. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, as, you know, especially you look even 10, 20 years ago, um, everything kind of looked to D&D because it was the flagship uh, product that kind of really brought role playing into the spotlight. And so when you're looking to something like D&D that was a, you know, a war game in its adolescence uh, for your cues, that's what you're going to get from it. Right. And then, like you said, you bring it in from the other side where you start telling stories with it. Mm-hmm. So what sort of stories are we going to tell? We're going to tell stories of heroics and mm-hmm. killing henchmen mm-hmm. and, you know, murdering our way through problems because swords and sorcery are very popular. And it's easy. And it's easy. Yeah. Um, I started looking, uh, you started looking into history, I started uh-huh. looking into pop culture. Go for it. Um, and so I started looking at, you know, what are, what are our modern story influences, you okay. know? And I mean, violence is everywhere. Oh, this, God, yeah. this sort of, this sort of thinking is, is everywhere. I mean, look at some of the, our, our more famous things, like Lord of the Rings, mm-hmm. you know, um, is, is a great piece of, of, uh, literature that kind of inspired a lot of what we know as modern sword and sorcery sort of stuff. And it's, you know, of course, it's my sword and my bow and my axe. They're pledging their weapons directly into it, you know, because they know they're going to kill their way through all the bad guys. Mm-hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not here trying to argue that orcs didn't need a good killing by the drove. Right. And, and their violence was probably the only way to solve a lot of those problems. But the story is driven by the violence. Right, right. You know, um, James Bond. Oh, God, Another yeah. one famous for just killing off henchmen left and right Mm -hmm. you know i mean even even the very opening of the james bond movies is the silhouette that famous silhouette of him seeing down the barrel of the gun right um and then he turns and he shoots and the whole screen goes red and you know um but just the the random killing of tons of henchmen yeah or 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 whatever uh the matrix oh god guns lots of guns yeah you know yeah uh, it's a, a, you know a lot of like our cyberpunk sort of stuff mm-hmm. um, is inspired by a lot of that. No, obviously the origins of a lot of the cyberpunk stuff goes well before that. Right. But probably our modern generation that's getting into things like Shadowrun and Cyberpunk mm-hmm. twenty seventy seven mm-hmm. grew up watching The Matrix. No know? doubt. Yeah. Um, or, or reading some of the more technical stuff. But again, it still fits under that whole yeah. genre of like individual roles going after larger nameless entities mm-hmm. with massive amounts of drones yeah you know workers henchmen whatever you want to call them brutes mm-hmm. it, it's it's still that same concept and an, an, a nameless force that you have to get your way through to get to the masterfulness that is on the other side puppeting everything and take that down and the only way to do that is with might mm-hmm. and most of the time when you get there you still can't achieve it it will slip through your fingers in some way mm-hmm. you know that's that's the age-old story of that but it's still we're talking about that that group that's in front, yeah. you know, and and we've talked about brutes and we've talked about henchmen and we've talked about all that. But what we haven't talked about is why we're senselessly murdering them without consequence Hell, in most even, cases. Even the big bad evil guy, though. Yeah. I mean, we, we brought it up earlier. It was the, the Princess Bride. Mm-hmm. Who kills Humperdinck? Nobody. Nobody. He lives. Jesus, Grandpa, why are you reading me this thing? Exactly, you know? exactly, exactly. It's, it really begs to ask the question. Like, you look at that story and you're like, he does get away? He does. Yeah, right. And I remember that being a punch in the gut of like, what, like, what do you, Grandpa, what do you mean? Like, yeah. I, even I as the spectator, I'm, I'm, I'm with Fred Savage on this. Mm-hmm. Like, what do you mean he lives? Mm-hmm. Why aren't we killing the villain, you know? Right. And it's weird. All these years later, I think that was a brilliant solution to the story. But no, it really when was. When I first watched it as a kid, I was like, oh, my God. Like, wh- why, would the, why would the villain live? He doesn't mm-hmm. deserve to live, you know? But does, does he deserve to die? Oh, we're getting back into another Lord of the Rings yep. Gandalf quote Yeah, we are. We are. Many who know. deserve death live and many who deserve life die. Yeah. Yep. Who would who would choose that for them? Would it be you? Mm-hmm. Something like that, right? Yeah. 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 It's 
it, it, it's making life choices, life choices. And that's the hard part. And like 7C has a grinding edge, basically saying that you are not killing, mm-hmm. you are wounding. Yep. Wounds are important things. Mortal wounds are important things. Wounding or tagging, I, I think, is yeah. another thing. Well, you have tagging, big, wounding, yeah. and uh, and dramatic wounds. Mm-hmm. And the idea of of dueling to the death is not something that is is done lightly. Yeah. You know? That's so. why you made such a big deal out of it when my character pulled out a rifle and shot someone in the head. Killing them, without question. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and, and, and didn't understand. I was like, they were pirates. They were boarding. They were going to kill us all. Mm-hmm. I did something smooth and efficient. One bullet solved the entire problem for us. Why are you all mad at me? Because you have a reputation. Because now I have a reputation. And, and I think that's what kind of we, we kind of get to when we're talking about this, is that when you look at reputations... That carries weight, and it should carry weight, but it depends on the story. And I think that there's a lot of people who like who forget that names have meaning. Um, there's been a lot of uh, a, a lot of drift from the classic kind of you know Conan the Barbarian, mm-hmm. you know, you know Grumwitch Orc Slayer, you know things like that. You're like that. There's a name. That's a reputational stamp yeah. that's being put on that person. Uh, if anybody's watched the uh, the The Witcher, oh yeah, yeah, uh, recently the, mm-hmm. they keep calling him the Butcher of Blavin. Yeah, because one town, one incident, things got a little out of hand. He ended up killing a handful of people. The Butcher of Blavin. That's that's his name forevermore. Yeah, you know. Yeah, because you you can't take that shit back. Mm-hmm. And like uh, uh, Wild Wild West did that with uh, the same thing. Mm-hmm. Where you had a general who l- basically murdered a whole town of people, and again that he that was his name from that point, mm-hmm. and so that kind of recourse can change a game. I'm just thinking of uh, Crowley Pub foe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, she did drop an entire inn, um, but I think that has. It, it, it's got its own point in games that you have to, that, that as a storyteller, if you feel that that is important, that your characters be recognized for their deeds, both good and bad, mm-hmm. reputation is an important thing. It really is, yeah. You know, you come into a town, um, Westerns used to do this all the time. Certain people would come into town, they'd sit down, they'd order a drink, and someone in the bar would recognize them. Yeah. You know, oh, ain't that Doc Holiday? Five guys get up, leave the bar. Three more turn, swiftly drink their their stuff, and kind of edge themselves to a corner or something like that. Where they case... might not catch a bullet, but right, they still right. kind of want to see what goes down. You know, the bartender, you know, removes a few things that are more expensive and puts mm-hmm. them below the bar. Grabs the little sawed off from below right. the bar and just goes, I don't want no trouble here. That's right. <laughs> exactly. And that's, that's the kind of feeling that you can get back into yep. games where... The fear is there, mm-hmm. and it's alive, and it's electric, and it, it's kind of spooky, you know, um, because your characters start questioning what they're doing. Yeah. You know, at the same time, you can set up scenarios where your the henchmen and or villains have the same kind of reputation. Mm-hmm. Like, um, Voldemort was a good character for that. He was just a normal dude in a store in the story initially, but as he started creating deeds, he started gaining a reputation where we wouldn't even say his name because mm-hmm. if they invoked his name, it meant he might come or one of his followers would do something in his name. Yeah. Yeah. And that's powerful. Mm-hmm. That that's carrying those kind of weights and stories is exceptionally powerful, you know, and finding when you can set that kind of weight and, and make a ripple effect uh, is important. Yeah. So yeah. I think that's what we're kind of getting at within getting the return to honor and stories is, can you set in games that don't have natural reputation curves like 7C does? Sure, sure. And there's a few other games that do it. Well, by natural reputation curve, you mean like some sort of a numerical game affecting... A mechanic. Mechanic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where, where it is pure story that's driving it, but it is still story important. It's world important. And I think this is where... Once you've built your world, when we've talked about that multiple times, where you've set what what's going on, who's important, what are the players, you know, what kind of theme, feel, all that. And once that's in play, and the players are in it, there are still a few living elements. And one of those living elements, I think, in the story is reputation mm-hmm. and the moral heartbeat of the story. You know, stories that begin with great battles 
or that are just after great battle or years after great battle where people are in remorse but they hate a certain group because of the attacks and atrocities they may have done on them sure or or a city that is based on you know slave commerce where you've got castes that are lower than most of the people there and those people need to have some level of a fight between them so you have you know players who know about the slaves and players who are part of the aristocrats you know the aristocrats yeah i did that <laughs> um that's that's our new show yeah um what do you call it the aristocrats um but uh somewhere in there you have this balance point where there's there's a tension and that creates a level of of point for the player to start making it alive Mm -hmm. and start working through it and that's where i think the morality kind of levels itself is what is morally okay Mm -hmm. and also what is what is something that they can do to change their reputation and i don't mean do as an active thing but do as as a the world reacts to them sure 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 i think reputation is a reaction to their actions yeah and you got to keep in mind too um i mean at least you're going to be realistic about it which Mm -hmm. which Maybe you don't want to be. Yeah. I mean, these are fantasy stories after all. You can go full fantasy where everybody knows that orcs and goblins are terrible things and need to be murdered. Yeah, sure. You know, um, the demons are terrible and need to be, you know, sent back to their hell dimension. But, you know, if if you are being realistic about it, um, you know, keep in mind that, that a bad deed carries you much further than good deeds, mm-hmm. you know. Um, my dad used to say, and my mom's going to hear this, I'm sure, because she listens to my podcast every once in a while. It it usually takes five attaboys to make up an oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way of saying yeah, it. It's, yeah, it's pretty much it's pretty much the case uh, right there. Knocks in the box is in the live chat, and he actually asks, uh, "Can I trick my way back into honor? Or exploit the power of subjective reputation?" <laughs> yes, and you actually can. You really can. You can. You can. It's it's manipulative as all heck, mm-hmm. uh, which in and itself is a bad deed. And typically, if people figure out that they're being manipulated, they will your good deeds will turn into bad deeds real mm-hmm, quick. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you absolutely can. Mm-hmm. It's it's just called play in the crowd. Yeah, and it it happens all the time. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's there's all kinds. I mean, of... that's that's politics in general. Yeah. So the, diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy until you can find a rock to throw. Yeah, large enough rocks. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 But. Uh... Yeah, but at, at the same time, we we say that there's this thing for role playing. But there's also another side of that. There are stories out there without violence. There are systems out there without violence sure. or limited violence or where violence is shunned. Um, or or violence is such a bad option. Yes. Because uh, how did uh, – um, was, Ar- was it Arcane Asylum that uh, uh, one of our listeners that, that, that put it as uh, – was it flushy water balloons or something like that? Yes, yes. Yeah, where uh, you know ev- everybody is so fragile and combat is so brutal and realistic yeah. that if you choose combat as an option, be prepared to die because mm-hmm. yeah, there, fate there is may a good well system. be or fatal – uh, What is it? Uh, dread. Uh, dr- well, I mean dread-, dread doesn't even have a combat mechanic. Correct. Literally, there's no mechanic for it. It's right. just like if the if the tower topples over, you're gone. You're gone. You're just right. removed from play but I think in that... some way that's thematically appropriate. Yeah, but I think that's very fleshy water balloon like. It's extraordinarily <laughs> fleshy water balloon, which is why I wanted to use the dread rules to run a Call of Cthulhu game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but but there's other games that do that really well. Um, like uh, looking a little bit more into um, uh, not Dungeon World. Um, Urban Shadows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at, like, the damage tracks v- based on what damage, like, a simple gun can put oh, out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, okay, uh, well, you take a grievous wound. Okay, we're done. Mm-hmm. Literally one one bullet was shot. We are done now. Mm-hmm. Either I need to mm-hmm. retreat or surrender. Because... There's some uh, pulp games that do the same thing mm-hmm. where it's, you know, when you've got... Uh you know, uh, Dick Tracy type characters or things like that, fighting mobs or, or other nefarious things. It's the same kind of thing. Bullets fly very rarely hit, but when they do, it is super significant, Mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's the kind of thing is like, you're moving cover to cover and it's mostly for effect than more than anything else. Yeah. You know, drawing a gun on somebody is suddenly meaningful. Like when the, you know, when you're, when you're in a room and, you know, the PI is sitting there and you're all having the, you know, the monologue moment and then the, the femme fatale pulls out the, the Derringer and puts it you know, to the to right, the, the little back. pistol that is like all of three inches big. You know, that's because firing twenty-two it pits, rounds. It pits in her tiny clutch purse. Right, right. But suddenly she has everyone's attention because yep. she has a gun. Yep. 
and bullets are significant. Yeah, so that's that's the kind of stuff that, that makes it. And then you have negotiation-based games, mm-hmm. where you're literally, it's almost a social interaction for everything yeah. that you're doing. Um, and the idea of having combat come into that suddenly is dirty. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. it's not something that happens. It's it's vulgar. Yeah. You know, uh, and it you're, causes you're, you're social an uncultured ruffian. Right. At that it, point. it causes yeah. social uh, disadvantage. Mm-hmm. You know, once you're known as someone who can't be social, you're no longer able to be. Right. Like you're, effectively, like in D anD D, you're now rolling disadvantage on all social roles. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, whoa, wait, why? Because you're a thug, and they know that. Yeah. Like you have a name. So yeah. Nobody, I, uh, no matter how, no matter how convincing you are, no one believes you because you're a thug. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's and honestly, that's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. amazing. I would yeah. love to play in a game like that. But uh, do, do you know what what system that is? Like, um, shoot, I'm trying to remember, but it's it, it's it says Kingdoms in the title, and I can't remember anything more than that. But um, it's like Kingdoms of something, okay. and it's it's effectively like the idea is is that you can play any class. You can you know, but typical classes are like you know, merchant, noble. Uh, knights, they're but they're mostly uh, the the uh, leaders of of groups. Sure, okay. And each one has a certain kind of faction value to it of what it's good at talking about. Oh, I gotcha. Okay. And the idea is is you're you're doing a lot more negotiations, you're dealing with things, but uh, you might have might be able to carry more weight in mm-hmm. a room full of generals if you're a knight. Sure, you know, sure, sure, sure. You know, then maybe a merchant or something like that. So, mm-hmm. and it's it's if you get into situations where you become physical or you attempt like a coup or you or you attempt an assassination it goes suddenly you gain reputation and a name and that gives you disadvantages on your social roles uh in those circles and when the circles start crossing suddenly you become uh the worst thing in the game to become is (laughs) non-communicado so basically once you have two circles that overlap with failure you can now both of those groups have now talked Mm -hmm. and you can no longer speak in those groups so you have to make your way back up in other areas yeah so yeah. All right. So, what do what do stories look like without violence? Then, I um, mean, there, there's there's obviously a handful of them out there. And very like much that. so. And I, I really think just about any game can be played if the, if if you lean more into the role play and less into the combat aspects of it. Even Dungeons and Dragons, which is a very heavily combat based game, yeah, can still be played. You know, I don't say like a pacifist. I mean, I don't think anybody's looking for pacifism, but maybe just not using kill it as every solution, you know? Right. But we also had a discussion um, in chat about this a little bit. And I think Overwatch made some good points about how d d it's cumbersome yeah. to work around it because it's not in the system for doing that. Right, right. Uh, and that does make it challenging to try and figure out, to, to switch your brain into the other role. Yeah. You know? Well, the, I think yeah, the, the the thing I always keep coming back to is that old uh, that old saying that like if you give a, if you give someone a hammer, every solution begins to look like an every every problem begins to look like a nail. Mm-hmm. And I think like looking at the D and D character sheet, yeah, you've got your skills kind of down mm-hmm. the middle, but then you've got this entire section based around combat and spells that help you in combat mm-hmm. and your hit points and your well, armor I mean, the, class. Look and at your, the book, like a good ninety percent of the book, ninety percent of it. Is about combat. 90% and the of your mechanics class of camp- abilities yeah. are how do you more efficiently kill things around you? Right, right. You know, extra or attacks, protect yourself extra from sneak killing attacks, things, yeah. extra spells yeah. to, you know, do things. Yeah. Right. Um, very few classes, uh, uh, like I think there's some like in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, mm-hmm. some of like the rogue classes mm-hmm. that have like um, socially manipulative things. There's mm-hmm. some bard things in there. Mm-hmm. But other than that, like almost everything, almost everything is more efficient ways to kill your foes. Yeah. And w- one of the things that I was reading about was, sure, you can put a, a nail in with a screwdriver, mm-hmm. but it's not efficient. Um, and they said, well, when the book contains 200 different hammers and five screwdrivers. Yeah. That right. are very different. Right. That are very different. And so you look at it, you go, okay, well, which one of these tools do I use? Well, there's all these hammers. I guess they want me to use a hammer. Yeah. And that's pretty much the way it looks at it. And when you look at the screwdrivers, you're like, I don't know what half of these things do. Mm-hmm. Like, or, or how to use them properly. Especially in a game about, na- you know, nailing in nails with hammers. Why why are you even handing me a screwdriver? You know, it feels, it almost feels like a non sequitur at that point. Right, right. Um, 
Then you have completely different games. Mm -hmm. And it took me finding the name of it. Um, And I'm probably going to say it wrong. But effectively, it's a... um, I think it's called uh, Hanabobo or Hanabono, um, which is heartwarming. That's what it means. Okay. And think of these as like your Ghibli style stories. So uh, they are stories of of heartwarming tales uh, and journeys. Mm -hmm. Um, So where combat is not something you want to get involved in. Yeah. um, It, it, that that's, that's terrible. Like getting injuries is a horrible thing. Even if it's somebody you don't like Mm -hmm. or you're having a problem with, like it's, it's just not going to happen. You either resolve your differences or just avoid them. Um, Nice, nice knocks. Not not habanero. That's too hot. That's hot. <laughs> um, but there there was uh, Golden Sky Stories. Um, uh, what is it? Uh, Chubo's Marvelous Wish Granting Engine, which is actually a story uh, generation system. Um, and one that I just recently looked at, which is I think Ryutama. Thank you. Yep. Um, which was kickstarted from the Japanese manga. Okay. Uh, to become to also be done in English. Uh, and they're still working on it. Mm-hmm. Um. But that one, literally, you're making characters with the sole purpose of, like, everybody in this world is goes on a journey. And and the family and friends and everybody supports them. So think of, like, the beginning of Kiki's Delivery Service. Uh-huh. Where they're like, oh, it's time for her to go and be a witch somewhere. Oh, that's so Okay, delightful. we're all going to do that. And everybody's oh, behind Kiki. you for doing that. But it's the challenges and it's mm-hmm. cooperative storytelling after that point yeah. about what the town is and what's going on. And what are the challenges and mm-hmm. how do you get through these challenges? Um, and the challenges between characters and things like that. And so it's, everything is very heartwarming and usually the play is like two hours of play. Um, it's closer to mouse guard in the way that it plays and the way that yeah. it moves. Um, you know, Mouse Guard, that's a great example. That's a, that's a game we're already we're already playing mm-hmm, where, mm-hmm. yeah, you know, I don't think we've killed a single thing in, in several game sessions. We've wounded things. We, we've wounded things to kind of drive them off, but they were like massive snakes and like we... Birds. We, we ticked off... I don't even know if we... We, we didn't really wound birds. No, we, we, just, we like... We, we ushered them away. We ticked off a beaver. Yeah. The other day. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, and <laughs> that was about as close to like... Yeah, I think the milk snake was about as close to like honest to goodness combat. As well, it straight gotten. up murdered one, like just gone, just pasted him. Yeah, he yeah. was gone. He got, he was taken. Yeah. So yeah, that guy we never got back. He yeah. was dead. So yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I don't think we even mildly inconvenienced the milk snake. It just didn't want to be where the pain smoke, pain and smoke was, so it left. Yeah. So I think that's where we start coming back to. So something like um uh. Something like Mouse Guard, Mm -hmm. those kinds of stories, because stories do end when people die, which is a phrase you say quite a bit. Um, But can you get to not killing everyone? I want to address something real quick. Sure, go for it. Because it just popped up in the live chat. Sure. And Knox in the Box is saying, in Ghibli, everyone is a reasonable person, but I don't know if that always works. And I I want to just actually take a moment and talk about that because I think it's a great kind of a, a good jumping off point for part of this part of this discussion. Sure. And that is just simply that um, everybody's a reasonable person. I'm not sure if that always works. Maybe it doesn't always work. It doesn't always work. But it depends on the type of story that you're trying to tell. I mean, if you're trying to tell a gritty realism Dungeons and Dragons story with swords and sorcery and, you know, villains and, you know, darkness and stuff like that that exists in your world, sure, everyone being a reasonable person is going to feel like a real non sequitur to that. But I think there's absolutely a niche for telling stories where people are reasonable and you can find solutions to problems that are nonviolent and cooperative and maybe even the mutual benefit of everybody. And um, I think it all really depends on the type of story you want to tell. You well, know, I think, it, I think that weighs heavily on the world. Yeah. Um, because you look at worlds like the dark crystal, right? Sure. 
think of how many times people died in the dark crystal or what was what was worse was an injury ter- terrifying mm-hmm. and it was it's it's a, again it's a we call it a children's story but it's still a world and it's still a story and mm-hmm. it still has weight on how the combat and things moved through in, within that story it wasn't just people randomly murdering the villains were terrifying mm-hmm. the monsters were horrific but they captured they didn't just murder everything you know well, it depends on how, what you view having your essence drained out is. Again, a terrifying moment that set precedence to not only the people who were in the same circle as that mm-hmm. individual, uh, but everyone else. But the people in that circle considered it terrifying, you know, but then they became unreasonable, mm-hmm. right? Now, now they were power hungry and they were living up to that level of power hunger. So it, it gives an unreasonable setting. And a terrifying moment without doubt, but the characters weren't going into that with that same weight of, I'm going to murder them. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't something there was, there was a constant fear. Yeah. So, so even though the world may be unreasonable, it doesn't mean the characters who are being played in it need to be unreasonable. Because their, their goal was, we just have to heal the crystal. Mm -hmm. Not, not we're going to go murder the Skeksis. Right. That was just, we just have to just literally... Take this crystal and plunge it into the bigger crystal. Mm-hmm. Done. Everything mm-hmm. gets solved. Skeksis be damned. You know. So yeah, that's actually that's a great point. Yeah. So I th- I think it's how you present the characters uh-huh. in the world. The world can be unreasonable and unruly and 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 weird. And yet, you know, because I can think of a couple of different, funny enough, Miyazaki stories where characters are not the, the world is not reasonable oh yeah the uh, world is exceptionally unreasonable castle in the sky laputa is my probably one of my favorites and it is very unreasonable and yeah the main the main villain in that is is just awful yeah just yeah. awful yeah i mean he's trying to harness a super weapon to go to war with i mean it's, correct yeah yeah um so i, I think that y- you you have to look at the world as one thing mm-hmm. but then who are the characters and what are their values? Right, right. And if you instill a certain value of the story on top of that, then yeah, I think you you change it. Even in pulp stories, that you can have char- you know characters who are who who respect life. Sure, absolutely. And aren't going to go on around killing every one of the bad guys that they come across and capture. I I would actually say like Adventure Tales of the Aeon Society. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I said it wrong. Adventure Tales of the Aeon Society Excellent. is a great kind of example of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, uh, Maxwell Mercer, the, the the head of the uh, the the Aeon Society, I'm sure is absolutely someone who will look at you and just be like, no, 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 don't, mm, don't drop your drink, don't drop my drink, uh, don't you know, don't kill them. You know, that's 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 what thugs and ruffians do. We are elevated. Right. You know, we are enlightened. Yeah. You know, we, we don't need to kill people like that. You right. Know, our, our duty is to humanity. Yeah. And you can't serve humanity by killing humanity. Right. You, know? you, you, you can't be the good cop if you are the bad cop. Exactly. You exactly. Know? And I think that's uh, even if you look at cop shows, I think that's a good example of it. Yeah. Is is, you know. Are you are you a are you part of the good cop genre where you capture everyone mm-hmm. and you make sure they get through justice regardless of what justice is? Right. You know. Right. Or you know, and and even Batman to a degree, you know. Or are you doing you know uh, the Wire? You know where everything is gray mm-hmm. or dark, and you got to make hard choices because everyone's gray. I'll tell you what, I've I've had enough of that type of story in my life. I need some black and white in mine. This is why I like Justified so much, mm-hmm. because the good guys were good guys, the bad guys were bad guys, and they strayed, they both strayed towards the respective middle line, mm-hmm. but they never crossed it. Your bad guys were always bad guys, your good guys were always good guys, except for Ava. Ava was weird mm. in that story, but everybody else. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think, I, I think to the point that I was trying to get to mm-hmm. is that... You have your world setting, which will determine whether people are reasonable, unreasonable, friendly, you know, unfriendly, whatever. Yeah. And then you have how you depict the player should be playing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a weight that you need to put on early because that's part of talking about what the game is. I, um, it's, it's, it's definitely a topic for session zero. Mm Mm-hmm. 
uh, you know, just what style of game yeah. and what style of game, what style of characters mm-hmm. um, you're looking for, what style of story you're looking to tell, mm-hmm. and what stories your, your players are looking to tell with their respective characters. Right. I think it's a great topic for session zeros uh, to have that conversation. But also, I think there's a little bit of uh, learning and teaching that mm-hmm. needs to take place during during the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, having your your villains willing to talk. Mm-hmm. Having non-violent solutions available and viable, right? You know, have them actually work, right? You know, um, so that you can teach your players essentially that this is an avenue in my story that you can take. Killing is not an an, an absolute. I remember um, one moment that sticks out from from a game I ran years ago. Right. Uh, I had a uh, the party had crossed an evil cult. Sure. And the cult had summoned, uh, summoned a demon assassin, essentially, to come kill them. Right. And they came to this, um, they crossed this bridge, basically, and waiting at the other side of the bridge was this hulking monstrosity summoned from the abyss. hmm And they were all, like, started, like, dice started hitting the table, and I'm like, what are you doing? And they're like, well, aren't, aren't we rolling initiative? And I'm like, I mean, not yet. I mean, the, the demon looks at you and says, ah... You finally made it this far. I will savor every moment of this. And he mm-hmm. starts monologuing to them. Mm-hmm. And I remember one of the players, and he said this in character too, looks at the demon and just goes, Are, r- really? You want, you want to talk about it? <laughs> like, he was actually flabbergasted that like there was a moment where they were going to talk mm-hmm. to the bad guy. Right. Instead of just roll initiative, let's fight. Yeah. You know? But that's not the style of story that I wanted to run was mm-hmm. like, oh, mo- monsters appear, let's fight now. You know, it, like, that's boring to me. Let's have a moment. I mean, don't get me wrong. They're not going to stop the demon from attacking them. He was just trying to savor the moment a little bit before, right. you know, uh, before he got into things. But it just made the scene more interesting if he monologued a little. And it just, yeah. it literally startled my players. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's it's always an interesting thing to see when you bring some reality to the situation. Um a good example is in Princess Bride. Like, the man in black is literally at the top having a conversation with his foe who's hanging off the side, you know, and he's just like, he he finally, you know, you know, and they're 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 talking back and forth and they finally get up there. He's like, oh, no, 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 take your mind, you know, you Take relax. time, yeah. Thank you, yeah. thank you. That's very respectable, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm absolutely going to kill you, but I'm not going to just ambush you. That right. would be a jerk thing to do. We're going right. to duel. Right, because, you know, that's the way you do it. Right. And it, it's it's a respect. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a level of, of uh, I would say a certain level of confidence, but at the same point, having that level of respect and decency. Yeah. You know, in things, I think you had a really great thing uh, way early on. We were talking about villains being reasonable uh-huh. and you were just like, you know, the one henchman who's been like, who's been the problem for the players, you know, and, and finally, like they make it and they're like, you know, you know, uh, it's like, oh, there he is. There's that guy in the bed. Like, what, what, what do you mean? Number two? Yes. You know, Ismail has been with me for, you know, many years now. He killed my dog. He did. He did what? He did what? Excuse me. He yes. will answer for that. Yes, we. You know, we. He, he lists off the things he did for his master yeah. and for the the company. He's just like, excuse me. I'm I'm very sorry. He's he gets very excited, and none of these things are the things that I would have wanted for you. So just you just and give I me a have moment. our differences, and I understand why you're here to thwart <laughs> me. But I want you to know that that level of disrespect did not come from me. <laughs> right. He will answer for what he is what he has wronged you <laughs> exactly. for. Exactly. And that's that adds a level of decency and throws a level of oddity to the story. You know, like, is this guy crazy? And the answer is no. Yeah. You know, he has a reason why he's there. Mm -hmm. He has a a direction that he was going for. And obviously he's taught his number two wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that is not the that is not the mission station maintenance of this company. That is not the direction we're taking. Right. Right. You know, those are not the core values. First off, you know, Matilda, please send in a pink slip. We need to. uh, (laughs) Right. Right. We're furloughing you for the next month because I'm reasonable. You're still going to have health (laughs) care. But we're going to do your monthly review now. (laughs) You know, normally I wouldn't do this in front of other people, but if you guys could just give me a moment. Yeah. <laughs> like, I understand you're under a tight schedule as well. You know, the bomb going off in like four hours, but. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but if you just give me 10 minutes to handle this situation, we can move through it with decency. You know, and that's that's where you you change things. You set a different tone. Mm-hmm. And I think that in that session zero, if you can set the tone for what, you're, what you expect your players and what they expect their lives to be like mm-hmm. of their characters. 
I think it changes everything. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. You want to get to some questions? I think we have two. I think we have two. We have two. I think we got about 15 minutes to go through two questions. We get to actually talk about them for a little Holy bit. Holy Lord, we can. I know, right? Yeah. Okay. Pick one. All right. Well, we're going to stop at the top. Um, Knox in the Box, who is with us in the live chat today. Thank you so much, supporter of the show. Always. Uh, when handling the treatment of a character's demise, do you tailor it for the collective campaign or how the PC wants it or a hybrid? Hmm. How do you kill characters? I think it depends on the setting. Yeah. Okay. Um. I don't kill characters mm -hmm. unless it is meaningful and has a point to it. Okay. Like, for instance, if if there was a point where I could kill a character, even in, like, 7C, mm -hmm. where the villains got them, and the, the, their death has meaning, mm -hmm. either it's a sacrifice of some kind or or it's a duel with, mm -hmm. a, with a clear end game point. Sure, sure. Um, I would make it, you know, theatrical to a degree. You know, but at the same time, I tend to leave openings for the the player. Like I, I don't consider death a fin a final moment mm -hmm. unless the player believes it is a final moment. Mm -hmm. You know, falling into an abyss or or you know getting killed by a villain and then kicked off the edge of a you know off the edge of a ravine. Yeah, or... and I I feel like you would actually have a conversation with us first and just be like, okay, do do you want this to be the end of your character? Right. I mean, you'd you know? go into darkness, and then it would be okay. We're gonna cut there. So what what are we doing? Yeah. 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 And I mean, even if the combat ends with like the group rushing the villain and blah 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 blah, and they're mm -hmm. like, okay. We're going to end this combat in the next session or start this combat end in the next session. Mm -hmm. So here's what happened. We're going to go from there. And by then I will have had an answer from that player of what's going on. Like, yep, you're you're dying. You're going to have to do some level of, of recovery on that. But, you know, I'm not just going to murder you outright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't feel that that's, I guess, respectful to the player. Yeah, okay. That, that, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, I mean, he he's in the live chat right now. He says, uh, "What if what if they don't want it theatrical?" Well, I mean, it's a conversation. Then, yeah, it's a conversation you have with your player mm -hmm. of uh, just you know what what sort of story are we looking to tell, and it's what you ask during the session zero to cover the life of that character, and if it does come down to the demise of that character, it's a good way to have a conversation about the end of the character and mm -hmm. uh, about how their story does end. Mm -hmm. If you don't want it to be theatrical, if you want it to just be your your character just dies and people move on. Then maybe roll a new character. Maybe we end the campaign. Whatever happens there, okay. Then, but but that's but it's it's our story to tell collaboratively between the storyteller and the player. It's an it should be an agreement. And if that's what the player wants, then that's the story I'm going to tell them. You know. Yeah. Um. Now, on the other hand, uh, I, again, I also think that it really depends on the game you're playing, like dread. I'm not going to ask you if you want your character to die. Mm -mm. I'm going to tell you exactly mm -hmm. how your character dies because that's the nature of the game. You're not really expected to live through a game of Dread, much the same way you're not really expected to live through a game of like Call of Cthulhu no. or something like that. But no. in a more story-based game like uh, Dungeon World, um, Urban Shadows, something out of Fate Core, I mean, yeah, it would probably be a lot more theatric if if that's the the agreed upon thing there'd probably be a lot more opportunity for finding that like maybe you're just subdued maybe you're just out for a while you know sort of sort of outcome grievously yeah. injured but we got you to a hospital so yeah i mean uh, Knox put in here like random encounter to take him out um and and henchmen killing characters <sighs> For me, I've found that that's backfired way too many times to either make players feel like they can just grind up new characters and that it's mm. pointless, which then th makes the story feel like trash. It makes life cheap. It makes life cheap, makes and, the story feel like trash. And I think in practice, um, you will find that as invested as you are in Nox as a character, mm -hmm. uh, having commissioned art of him... Um, having commissioned your, uh, your miniature of him, et cetera, et cetera. A plushie. A plushie. Uh, I think if he did die to just some random henchman just stabbing him, and then there was no fanfare, like, I think you would find that in practice you would be a lot more hurt by that loss than you think you would. Yeah, or, or dying to just bad dice. I, I like that ones are no longer a critical thing. Yeah. 
that yeah. really made a huge difference because it it doesn't feel like you're just dying to a dumb role. Right, right. I I I still narrate ones, mm-hmm. but those are they're, they're, they they don't have any extra added effect. It's right. more just that the way I describe the failure is a little more extravagant. Okay. You know, okay. but that's 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 it. It's never like, oh, your sword flies out of your hand and hits the fighter in the head. He takes a D6. Da-, you know, yeah, it's never like that. It's yeah. just, you know. All right. Do you feel good about that one? I feel good about that one. All right. Uh, the Mad Elf asks a common element in early tabletop RPGs is combat. One could make the case that early gaming was all about murder hobos. As games have evolved, what are a few that you like which do not have combat and violence as a core component, or a conflict resolution system that's not combat related? I mean, honestly, I would say Mouse Guard's a great way to look at that, because it's it's not combat so much as it is action and consequence. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's a a great game that we Um, brought up, that we are currently playing, so we have experience with, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Do not have combat and violence as a core component... Or conflict conflict resolution system that's not combat related. I mean, Seventh C to a degree has a heavier weight toward actions and social. Uh, towards towards actions and social, yeah. It does it's, it's not that it doesn't have combat. It's just that it it's it not lends, weighted. It's not weighted so much to combat. And, and in fact, it's weighted against it in many ways. In in many ways, yeah. I mean, reputations against it as, as as a key component. And it's one of those games, like I was talking about earlier, where if a firearm comes into play, <sighs> literally the whole the whole battle. Changes. Pitches and changes. Um, I'm trying to think of, of games that I have played that aren't really combat related. Um, Okay, so here's one that I don't know that we've ever mentioned on this on this show before. Okay, all right. Toon. Oh, Jesus. I remember Toon. Holy right? God. I played Toon as one of my first games, like when I was back in Palladium Land. Um, Damn, it's been a long time since I played Toon. Yeah. Like I, I don't even know if I could remember the rules right for Toon. Uh, I just remember chutzpah was a stat. Oh God, yeah. And that's how I learned to pronounce chutzpah correctly. Yep. 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 It's actually had a pronunciation guide in there. Um, it's uh, it's 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 uh, Yiddish for uh, for nerve, basically. Uh, if, if you you know the oh the nerve on that guy to 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 do something so bold, mm-hmm. that's that's chutzpah. Okay. To, that it takes to do something like that. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's it's panache and panache. Yeah, yeah I this like means that. a certain flair. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much the truth. Pretty much the truth. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was it was perhaps a violent game because it was styled off of a lot of like the Warner Brothers style cartoons yeah. that were, you know, Wiley e. Coyote. You know, smacking people with frying pans, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Roger Rabbit style stuff. Yeah, but. There really wasn't a death mechanic. You, you fell down, mm-hmm. and you were just out until next scene because that's what tunes do. Mm-hmm. But of course, they get back up, mm-hmm. you know, or they come in through the next door or whatever. Right. Yeah, I mean, how many times do you watch Wiley e. Coyote get smashed with his own wrecking ball while trying to kill the Roadrunner? Right. So he's flat against the wall, literally flat, literally smashed you know? flat. And the other character grabs them like they're a sheet of paper and fluffs them out, or uses like bellows to pop them off, whatever. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah you just totally. get back up. Yeah, recovery, if you will. Right. So, yeah, I, I would say Toon is a, a good result of that, um, where it's not conflict, it, it's not murder-centric. Mm-hmm. It's There's still some combat, there's action. I think, though, that, I mean, we because we were, we've been, there's kind of been an ongoing conversation between us, our, our, our personal group of, of storytellers, yeah. our, our personal friends groups, yeah. um, about uh, extending a lot of the things that we see in play in Mouse Guard into some of our other games. Well, I mean, it's a blending of games. Um, and, and the concept, and this is something that uh, uh, the Mad Elf constantly tells us during, because he mm-hmm. is the storyteller for our Mouse Guard yep, games, yep. Um, he constantly tells us is there's no such thing as failure in Mouse Guard. Right. You do not fail in this game. <laughs> and that is um, just simply that, okay, so you may not have made your role, there might be some unforeseen consequences, you may have some extra obstacles to overcome, mm-hmm. but... You don't fail in Mouse Guard, right? You know, um, and and I, it, it's a concept that's taken me a while to kind of wrap my head around because I grew up on games where yeah. things were success or failure. Yeah, Seven C was the same way, where th- the, especially Second Edition, because it's consequences. If you don't do something, there are consequences, but it's not a failure. It's not like you're just dead. 
like, oh, I need to escape this room, and I need two successes, one to not take damage by the fire, and two to s- escape the room. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I only make one success. Do I want to get out? Or do I want to go, or do I want to be unscathed, but here? But he, but stuck here. Yeah. You know, and you're you're stuck there now for the turn because you didn't make the escape. Mm-hmm. So you, you're you out of the next scene, but then you have to explain your entry into the following scene. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you, you know, maybe it's a chase and the whole group makes it out the door and into the carriage. And so now they're racing away in this carriage and they realize you're not there. And then the next scene is them, you know, exiting the town, you know, and coming up to, you know, it's late in the night, the carriage broke down and they're finally making their way to this small inn and they walk in the door and there are four of the guards and you, your character in guard clothing, covered in black soot, laughing at the table. Mm -hmm. And as you walk in, you kind of stare at them, you know, and everyone stands up at the table to alert you and he knocks them out and clears the table of, of their bodies, grabs drinks for everybody, and says, we can handle them in a minute. Let me tell you a story. <laughs> so no shit. There I was in the fire. <laughs> <laughs> no, there is too much. Let me sum up. <laughs> uh, Heatsink uh, is uh, in the live chat, and he is asserting that uh, Dresden Files is oh. uh, one of the one of the game systems that is uh, leans towards the non-combat. Okay. Okay. And uh now that's based off of the fate uh the fate system. Right. Um and uh as he says uh there's conflict but it's not core kill everything. The system right. isn't combat focused, it's storytelling focused. Fair. And I I think that's a fair assessment. Mhm. Um I definitely think there's there's a lot of conflict. Mhm. But I think he's right in that the goal is is rarely kill your opponent. Yeah, and especially given given the game world that it's set in, or I should say the the story world that it's set mm-hmm. in, is based off of the Dresden Files books right, by right, Jim right. Butcher. Um, there are such things called the Unsealy Accords, hmm. which is essentially the um, the Geneva Convention for the supernatural world. Right, and. Um, there's a lot of rules about how various supernatural factions can and can't interact and under what delicate circumstances killing a member of an enemy faction is even tolerated without sparking an entire war. Right. Um, which is actually a major plot of some of the books because mm-hmm. certain lines get crossed and one of those one said war does actually break out. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of maneuvering of like, oh, wow. They actually lured us into a circumstance where they're going to force us to start the war for them, so we're the bad guys. Because yeah. the Unsealy Accords say this and this and this, and we're only allowed to make two choices, and one of them is unacceptable. Mm-hmm. So the only other choice is kill that guy over there, and we fire the first shot. Yeah. Great. Speaking of fate, mm-hmm. um, since we're coming up to time here in just a few minutes, um, I wanted to talk about a our next episode a little bit. Okay. Um, so uh, Knox in the Box had, had sent some ideas to us because we had talked about uh, playing with characters with, with uh, I will use the term disabilities. Okay, um, yeah. Everything from deaf, blind, you know, uh, um, mobility issues, things like that. Like sure. How do Accessibility you, issues accessibilities in general. Yeah. In general. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you handle that? And so I did a little bit of research, and I actually found out that there's some great stuff out there. Okay, great. Uh, and great groups. So I'm going to get into that. But one of the things that they brought up was there's a whole um, errata for Fate that oh. the writers of Fate and another author assisted in. Okay. And it's not just about playing with players who have disabilities and what you can do to help them, mm-hmm. um, but also playing with characters who have disabilities. Oh, interesting. Okay. And being careful not to try and heal them. Right, right, right. Because right. that's not necessarily what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. You know, we have heroes and things like that in stories which have overcome their disabilities mm-hmm. through, you know, chairs and whatever and power suits. But that's not necessarily what those people want. And sure. it's it's a good framework to read. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I read just a little bit of it, but I'm probably going to end up picking it up before next uh show and, and doing some more reading so all right great but uh we are coming up to the end of our uh our show here and i think it worked out pretty well yeah hey dude can we take a moment to, me- to mention that this was episode 50 oh my lord it's kind so, of a milestone for us i'm just saying very true so you can find us on twitter at st underscore conclave or instagram at st underscore conclave uh if you're listening to us live right now that's on mixlr.com slash storyteller 
uh, dash conclave. Our Discord link is in our Twitter on the episode description. You can find us there or on our website. I want to give a big shout out to our Patreon members who help support the show every month. Thank you so much. Knocks in the box, especially for being such a great contributor, and all the rest of you for uh, for, for helping us keep doing this. Uh, and Sam for all. rejoining us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the intro music uh, for us today was Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. You can find that at geefrogmusic.weebly.com. Uh, our outro music is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Midair Machine. You can find her on soundcloud.com slash midairmachine. And a big shout out to our families, Vicky and Sean. Yes. All of our friends who have sat at our gaming tables throughout the years. And you, our listeners, in these crazy times, we hope you're all doing all well. Yes, yeah, stay you and your safe, are healthy. stay clean, just wash yeah. your hands, wear those masks. We'll get through this together, and we'll be here every week for you. We love you. Love you. Good night. Night.